Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, I especially want to thank the organizers of the conference and my fellow presenters for sharing their important work. Um, before I do anything else, where's the clicker? Um, I'm going to give you a quick, uh, quick roadmap for this presentation. So I want to introduce you to what website defacement actually is, because I'm sure there are some people in this room who haven't heard of it. Uh, I'm going to give you a discussion of the theoretical framing I'm going to be using to examine it, and then I'm going to talk about some descriptive detail that I found through studying it. So first, what is website defacement? So website defacement, now if, unless you're a webmaster or you've been very unlucky, you probably haven't run across website defacement in the wild. Uh, so I'm going to begin with a quick visual. So this is a web page belonging to the Zambian government's Department of Labor. It's the sort of page that you go to if you're looking for a job with the government. You see what jobs are currently available. If you went there last Sunday, this is what you'd see. So what's happening is that uh, Black Master Hacker has gained administrative access to the Zambian government's website and replaced their page with his own message. Um, this sort of activity mirrors in many ways physical graffiti. It's, you know, sometimes obnoxious, almost always illicit, and it can still be useful for studying people who might not otherwise have a voice. Um, website defacement's a pretty rudimentary form of hacking. It's really endemic on the web. It's hard to measure the exact frequency of website defacement because these sorts of things are often corrected, cor corrected quickly. Um, but Zone H, the archive that I've used, records somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 defacements a week. Um, most of this vandalism is reversed fairly quickly, either by webmasters or frequently now by automated systems that notice that something's been changed and change it back. Um, perhaps because of this, not very much has been written about website defacement, and most of the literature on it is technical. So a lot of it's saying, hey, we need to find, th this thing is happening, how do we correct it really quickly? Um, defacement's treated almost like a programming bug, as a technical problem which needs to be solved. Um, but as a humanist, I'm less concerned with these technical details, and instead I want to talk about defacement not as a technological nuisance, but instead as a medium for individual expression and communication. So how should we think about website defacement? Why does it matter that we're talking about this? So to talk about digital graffiti, I think it's first important to talk about using metaphors in the digital sphere. Um, this is something that other people have talked about here. Uh, but a lot of the digital stuff that we deal with, we, we talk about using metaphors. So the basic example is, this is a desktop, but if I use this desktop to make paper mache, I'm going to owe the I'm going to go Michigan State University a lot of money. Whereas if I use this desktop to create a paper mache model, it would be fine. <laughs> digital folders don't fold. Digital archives are not the same as physical archives, but it's still useful to frame things in this way because it helps us to think about them. So as Marshall McLuhan says, and probably his second most overquoted phrase. <laughs> The content of any medium is almost always another medium. The content of writing a speech, just as written word is the content of print, and print is the contact of the telegraph. So a web page is not the same thing as a physical page, but it is a page's evolutionary descendant. And in the same way, I'm seeing website defacement as the evolutionary descendant of physical graffiti. I think it's a useful lens for studying the medium, and it's especially a useful lens for understanding why it's important to pay attention to it. So why should we study graffiti in the first place? Well, the graffiti in classical Greece and Rome, which is often referred to by the dignified names of inscriptions or epigraphy, has long been accepted as valuable. Contemporary graffiti has struggled to seek representation in the academy. So, the argument for why we should actually pay attention to graffiti, put simply, is that if this, which is uh, some graffiti in Pompeii, is a valuable insight into ancient culture, something like this, or like this, 
And as a librarian, I especially endorse uh, the, second, uh, the second act of graffiti is an important insight into the culture of the people who created them. Graffiti is interesting from, the from an artistic or aesthetic perspective, um, but it can also be interesting because it's a form of public communication that bypasses gatekeepers, sometimes literally. Um, graffiti is, it reflects views that are not present in the popular discourse or preserved commonly in the archive. Um, it's overly simplistic to say that graffiti is only practiced by the marginalized. There are definitely bankers, politicians, journalists who've written anonymous messages in bathroom stalls. But the anonymity of graffiti creates a level playing field, reducing and sometimes even eliminating the, advan the social advantages of race, class, and social position, and with the web, location. In the words of Armando Rodriguez, with graffiti, any person can say whatever, however, and whenever to whomever. Digital graffiti only expands the reach of the graffitist. For the defacer, the entire World Wide Web is blank wall waiting to be tagged. So how do you study it? Studying defacement in any sort of systematic way can be pretty challenging. Graffiti is ephemeral and the web is a huge place. So just imagine trying to catalog all the graffiti in this city that's created in the space of a year especially given that most often the graffiti will be quickly wiped out, erased by either the property manager or by police or by someone else. It's a challenge. Um, and the web is an even larger space, and things can change back even faster. So this is, in many ways, a, a Herculean task. But fortunately, the hackers themselves are helping us. So I mentioned before, most of the information I get is from a site called Zone H, which is a repository that collects mirrors of uh, defacements. So hackers will alert the, uh, the moderators of Zone H, or frequently their, their automated systems, say, I've hacked this site, take a snapshot of it, and that will be stored. Um, Zone H archives about 800 to 3,000 defacements a day. It fluctuates kind of wildly. Um, and these range from the insertions of just a few lines of text to complete replacements of an entire site. This is a whole lot of information to go through, so I've focused on the starred defacements, um, which are defacements of government websites, uh, educational websites, and major corporations. Um, while Zone H allows us to study defacement, it also creates limitations. The first and foremost, Relying on it means that I'm only, submit, I'm only studying defacements which are submitted to and archived by Zone H. Um, and without some sort of outside record, it's really hard to tell how representative this collection is. Um, so one thing that really surprised me when I first began using this um, is you read a lot in the popular press about Russian hackers, Chinese hackers, North Korean hackers. They aren't recorded in this archive. There, I didn't find a single incident of Russian defacer and more than a year's worth of data. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, that there aren't Russians who are defacing websites, they just don't have the same archiving practices and aren't using the same archive. And I wasn't able to find them in any of the smaller archives I looked at as well. Um, so any conclusions that you make about demographic trends are only tentative and you can maybe say some things, but you don't want to extrapolate to say this is the whole existence of web defacement. But you can still learn some things. So first, some basic descriptive information. Uh, the majority of Zone H archives come from, uh, of defacements, come from Latin America, the Middle East, North Africa, and Southeast Asia. So this is uh, August 2016 and March 2017, so you can see that it's pretty similar. Um, Brazil is a major center, as is Saudi Arabia, as is Indonesia. Um, but there is some variation month to month. Um, one thing you'll notice is in March 2016, Colombia was an incredibly, uh, it was a major hotspot. And, af and after then, in, in uh, March, there's none. Um, this is because there was a single organization that was systematically defacing all of the Colombian government's websites, um, and they became inactive in December. So shows the impact that one person can have there. Uh, defacers typically either deface websites of their own country, like that Colombian defacer, or their near neighbors. So um, 
uh, Turkish defacers will often deface Saudi Arabian uh, websites. Pakistani and Indian defacers will often deface each other's websites. Um, or defacers will just act completely randomly and go again after anything that has low security. Um, it's hard to tell exactly how much of this activity is done by individuals and how much is done by teams. It seems like it's roughly even, but sometimes teams of defacers can look like an individual and sometimes uh, because one individual will take credit and sometimes as anyone who's done group work will know, a team will take credit but one individual is doing all the work. Um, English is the most common language in defacements regardless of the national origin of defacers. The next most common languages in order are Arabic, Malay, and Portuguese. As you can imagine, Malay was primarily used by Indonesian defacers and Portuguese by Brazilian. Um, while well, Arabic was used across the Middle East and North Africa. Interestingly, Arabic, while it's the second most common language, is almost never the sole language used in defacements. Um, it's almost always paired with English. Um, often, this is just a, so this is an example of a Saudi Arabian defacer's work, and often it's just a cut and paste into Google Translate. So if you take the Arabic, paste it into Google Translate, you get the exact text uh, that's there in English. Um, the languages can tell us a lot about the potential audience for this defacement. Hackers writing in English, especially hackers whose lang first language is not English, are tr clearly trying to reach an international audience. This doesn't necessarily mean that they're trying to reach an Anglophone audience, although they might be, um, but English is a common second language internationally, especially online, so they're trying to spread their message as widely as possible. And so what are these messages? And this is where I think things get really interesting. The majority of uh, website defacements don't have any sort of political messaging. They're mostly personal expression, and it ranges from very simple messages like this to elaborate multimedia spectacles like this. This is the same organization to show a contrast. Um, the former is most analogous to just tagging a building, while the latter might be seen as really complicated street art. Um, regardless of the simplicity or sophistication of these defacements, though, they're all making that same existential statement. They're saying, I was here, I exist, I matter, you should pay attention to me. Um, there's also an interesting sort of subset of these defacements in which they say, hey, admin, you've got low security, contact me and I can help you fix it, sometimes for money. And so it's also saying, I exist, I matter, I recognize that you exist and you should maybe be paying me. Uh, while these personal expressions take many forms, some pre features are prevalent throughout. Images of guns and weapons are extremely common, suggesting that defacers embrace the, the conceptualization of cyber war and the militarization and aggression such concepts entail. So this is an example of a Brazilian defacement. Um, like a military parade, these images act as a demonstration of force more than an active threat. Weapons symbolize the defacer's strength and are more a sort of totem than a tool. In addition to weapons, gas masks are extremely common, which can be seen as symbolizing both the anonymity that defacers seek to retain and the toxic environment that they see themselves in. Hidden faces occur in other contexts as well, most famously in the Guy Fox mask of the Hacktivist Anonymous Collective, but also in figures wearing hoodies, figures with face obscuring scarves, figures with the face edited out. The these faceless figures serve a similar purpose to the hacking pseudonym not to make the defacer anonymous, unless of course they're acting as anonymous, but rather to distance the defacer from their offline legal personage. The effect is to create a separate cyber identity which cannot be connected to the defacer in real life. So despite the anonymous and transnational nature of the web, or perhaps because of it, defacers often exhibit a strong national identity. Many defacers use their nationality as a primary identifier and will often include like shout outs or they call them greets to other hackers who share their nationality. In some cases, merely claiming a national identity can be a political act. So this is a defacement of a Turkish government website by a Kurdish hacker. And Kurdish, being a Kurdish hacker here is significant. By, I being, by identifying as a Kurd and raising the Kurdish flag over Turkish property by capturing it, at least temporarily, this small act of resistance reflects a much larger geopolitical struggle. Um, I'm gonna quickly show a few more defacements because I'm running out of time, but many defacers are much more specific in their political messaging. So this is a Mexican defacement uh, 
bemoaning corruption in the government. They occasionally um, reflect specific actions. So this is just a couple of weeks old. This is the president of uh, Algeria, and when he announced that he was going to run for a fifth term, despite not being seen in public for five years, uh, they say, help us, we are hostage to this zombie. Um, but often they reflect ongoing conflicts such as the Gaza conflict um, and the conflict over Kashmir. So this is uh, the West Bank and Go Modi Go. It's of course a reference to, uh, to the conflict between India and Pakistan and Kashmir. Um, so in, in sum, I want to say that studying defacements can't solve all the problems that they reflect. Clearly, you can't study this and solve the, the, the conflict between Pakistan and India. Uh, but it does allow the concerns of people to be heard who might not otherwise be able to be heard. It brings new and important voices into the conversation. And with that, thank you.